You can also listen to Q&A on C-SPAN Radio, exclusively on XM Satellite Radio. It's also online as a C-SPAN podcast. And now a House hearing on potential cybersecurity threats to the electric grid. We'll hear from the president of the North American Electric Reliability Council, which is responsible for protecting the grid from attack. This is about two hours, 15 minutes. The subcommittee will come to order. This morning, we're addressing a means of protecting the nation's electricity grid from cybersecurity threats through which computer hackers could maliciously gain access by way of the Internet to the computers controlling key components of our nation's electricity system and cause either short-term system outages or more serious permanent system damage. No industry is more essential to the nation's economy than is our electricity sector, and its protection is vital to both our economic security and to our national security. The nation's electricity system consists of generators and regional networks of interconnected transmission lines. The controls which operate the grid and electricity generators attached to it are increasingly computer connected to the Internet. In fact, increasing the degree of interactive grid computerization is a major element of the development of a smart grid which will improve system reliability, optimize generation, promote load balance, improve consumption management, and integrate new smart appliances and equipment. But with increased reliance on interactive digital technology comes the added risk of computer hackers entering the system and causing, causing uh, truly extensive damage. The Idaho National Laboratory conducted tests using the code name Aurora, demonstrating that standard utility control systems could be tr penetrated and adversely affected through uh, unauthorized computer access. This demonstration showed that a cyber intruder could manipulate the control systems of a generation facility, resulting in massive physical damage that could take months to repair. Cyber attacks on electricity systems have occurred in a number of nations, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission reports 20 documented cases where hackers have penetrated networks and were able to affect controls on dams, on a nuclear reactor, and have disabled backup generation and shut down power plants. The Defense Science Board reports that U.S. grid control systems are continuously probed electronically, and while none has yet resulted, uh, none has yet been the subject of uh, major uh, damage or grid outages in the United States. Cyber attacks have caused major grid outages in other nations. In 2007, the Department of Homeland Security notified the North American Electricity Reliability Corporation, known as NERC, of the Aurora vulnerability demonstrated by the Idaho National Laboratory. Based on this notification, the NERC issued an advisory to 1,800 owners and operators of facilities associated with our nation's power grid and provided a 60-day schedule for immediate mitigation measures as well as longer-term measures that would be implemented over a 180-day period. But compliance with this advisory recommendation was entirely voluntary by these 1,800 owners of facilities that are components of the national grid. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission recently audited compliance with the advisory issued by the NERC and conducted that audit among uh, 30 utilities. It found that of the 30 audited, 23 were not in compliance with the NERC advisory. One utility reportedly had a 10-year compliance schedule, notwithstanding the fact that 180 days was the outer limit for compliance in the uh, NERC advisory. Another utility had never changed the factory installed usernames and passwords on its computers controlling its systems. 
And it was therefore clear that self-interest alone was not a sufficient motivation to mitigate the Aurora vulnerability. Based on the documented threat to the electricity system and on the noncompliance with voluntary measures which the audit revealed, the FERC, along with the U.S. Department of Energy and the Department of Defense, have identified an urgent need for legislative authority to allow the Federal Government to compel implementation of the measures to respond to the cybersecurity threat to our nation's electricity grid. In response to that need, this subcommittee on a bipartisan basis has developed a bipartisan discussion draft. It requires the FERC to undertake a rulemaking to determine what measures or actions should be required to protect the bulk power system against vulnerabilities and then provides the FERC with the authority to enforce the rule once adopted. In addition, the FERC would be granted authority to issue such emergency orders as it deems necessary to protect the reliability of the bulk power system with regard to potential new cybersecurity emergencies not identified in the original rule, which uh, are judged to be imminent threats uh, under presidential declaration. While the discussion draft represents uh, an outstanding bipartisan step toward enactment of the necessary Federal legislation, several questions do remain open, uh, and these questions will be addressed by our witnesses this morning. The outstanding issues include whether any legislation should be limited to cybersecurity threats alone, or whether a grant of authority to address physical attacks on the grid should also be included. Another open issue is the exact wording of the specific definition of cybersecurity threat. Uh, a third open issue is uh, the set of circumstances under which interim measures may be discontinued once they are activated. And finally, the scope of the bill with regard to whether it includes entities not technically within our bulk power system, such as uh, the electricity systems of the states of Hawaii, uh, and Alaska, the territory of Guam, and also core distribution facilities for electricity uh, in some of our major cities, such as New York City and Washington, D.C. Uh, and we will hear from our witnesses uh, with regard to their sometimes contrasting views on, on these uh, outstanding issues. Today's hearing will feature expert witnesses who will present information on both the potential threat of cybersecurity tax uh, against the uh, electricity system and also the appropriate legislative response that we should be making to guard against those threats. Uh, I, I want to commend the uh, staff uh, on a bipartisan basis for the outstanding work that they have done during the August recess uh, on this matter. Uh, the staff on both sides of the aisle have uh, participated together in obtaining briefings from the agencies I've identified in this statement. They have participated together in constructing the legislative draft that is the subject of our hearing this morning, the discussion draft, uh, and I want to uh, commend them for doing that at a time when Congress was not here and uh, when they were uh, busily at work attending to this urgent business. I also want to say uh, thank you to the ranking member of this subcommittee, Mr. Upton from Michigan, uh, for his outstanding efforts and, and for that of his staff. Uh, he and I have uh, had discussions with regard uh, to this matter. Uh, we are participating jointly in the exercise to move our discussion draft to final legislation and to markup. Hopefully that will occur uh, uh, perhaps within the course of the coming week. Uh, and uh, that partnership is a reflection of how this subcommittee and our full committee operates when it is at its best, and that is working in a bipartisan fashion to produce uh, consensus solutions to the major problems uh, that confront us. Uh, nowhere has that effort been better reflected than in uh, the work that has been done over August and that we continue here this morning. And at this time, I'm pleased to recognize uh, the ranking Republican on the uh, Energy and Air Quality Subcommittee, uh, Mr. Upton of Michigan, for his remarks. Well, thank you, and I do want to thank you and, and uh, the staff on both sides. Uh, uh, this is a very important hearing, uh, an issue that we need to deal with. 
Uh, I appreciate our witnesses joining us uh, this morning as well. Uh, many of us know that the House Homeland Security Committee has examined the issue. It is uh, focused, they have focused on the vulnerability in electric generator control systems which could allow remote access, enabling a bad actor or terrorist to remotely destroy a generator. And today we are going to follow up on those hearings and seek additional answers with a focus on the most productive way to ensure the security of our, in, of our energy infrastructure. Members of this committee will follow up next week with a classified briefing on the topic as well. And following that briefing, I, I know that we can work together on bipartisan legislation. I would commend uh, both Mr. Dingell and Mr. Barton uh, in their efforts uh, to that end. Major questions do need to be addressed. Is there an actual threat capable of causing catastrophic damage? Is there a regulatory gap that needs to be filled? Which agency should take the lead? And I hope that our witnesses will help address those questions today. Security of our nation's energy infrastructure from attack is one of the most important issues that our committee will address. This is not an issue where, that we can take lightly or cover it up in just one hearing. Energy has been one of the leading issues debated in the Congress this year, and rightfully so. Energy literally powers our economy. Even small price spikes and supply disruptions can have a large, important economic impact. It is imperative that the security of our nation's energy infrastructure gets the attention that it deserves. I look forward to working with all of my colleagues uh, to address this in a most beneficial way. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Upton. And, and again, I thank you for uh, the outstanding cooperation you and your staff have provided on this matter. The uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized for three minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman uh, Boucher, uh, for holding this important hearing today and having it on 9 11, the seventh anniversary of that horrific event. Uh, it serves as a stock reminder that addressing the vulnerability of cyber threats is long overdue. We have seen the reality of these incidents in various settings over the years, including the slammer worm at the davis Bessie nuclear power plant uh, and the Aurora vulnerability exposed at the Idaho National Laboratory. We know that this threat is real. We also know the impacts are real and potentially devastating. The Northeast blackout in 2003, when an estimated 50 million people lost electricity, is estimated to have cost up to $10 billion and eight lives. And we also know the impacts of these events are the same regardless of whether the incident is caused by someone who wants to do us harm or someone who simply doesn't know they are about to. But this hearing is timely for other reasons as well. This nation is finally, after years of control and uh, pocket padding by the uh, oil industry, gathering the momentum to transition away from a dependence on foreign oil. It is a long overdue transition, and every day that we wait to reach out our course is a lost day. Based on the knowledge we have gained through hours of hearing in Congress, we know that the grid stands as one of the best and most immediate solutions to this crisis. With the surge in interest in alternative energy sources tapping into the grid and the increasing use and promise of electric vehicles, the grid is vital to our move towards energy independence. But it can only serve in this critical role if it is protected as a crucial asset. Fundamental changes to the structure of our grid could also eliminate or reduce cyber threats or diminish the harm resulting from them. Features uh, offered through the developing smart grid technology, for example, could be used to reduce this threat and better position our response to such an event should a cyber attack occur. Likewise, more distributed generation could conceivably reduce the extent of the impacts of a cyber attack. I thank you, uh, Chairman Boucher, for uh, having this uh, hearing. Uh, it is obvious that the technologies that affect uh, the two wires or the three wires that go into everyone's home, uh, the, uh, the cable, uh, the phone company, and the electric company are now all merging in terms of the technologies. Uh, and one can help the other, and the other can help the one uh, as we 
learn how to use technology uh, both to advance our energy and uh, uh, energy independence uh, agenda and at the same time uh, uh, ensure uh, that we are being protected uh, from homeland security uh, threats. So I thank you for being there. I see uh, Jim Langevin down there, we, my good friend. We welcome you. Uh, here as well, and I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Markey. And uh, as you have noted, this issue uh, is at the focal point of several issues in which you and I have a common interest, and that is information technology policy as well as energy policy, and I very much welcome your remarks today. The gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Barton, the ranking Republican member of the full committee, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just returned from the 911 ceremony out at the Pentagon, so there couldn't be a better time to hold at this hearing on cybersecurity as we uh, memorialize those uh, brave men and women um, who gave their lives on September the 11th, both at the Pentagon and at the World Trade Center and in the fields of Pennsylvania. Um, we have a real threat against the United States of America. Uh, it's not going away, and we need to defend ourselves against it, both militarily and, as this hearing is going to show, electronically in terms of protecting the power grid that provides electricity for our great nation. I think we have a lot to learn in this area because the whole idea of, of a cyber attack is something that's, quite frankly, somewhat foreign to most of us, myself in, included. We have some feeling for, for the, uh, the physical attacks which we have seen against our nation uh, time after time, but this is a new type of attack. What are the vulnerabilities? Is our electricity grid adequately protected? Uh, will a one-time cyber reliability rule solve the problem, or do we have to have uh, redundant systems and, and change those over time uh, to upgrade against the continually changing threat? What are the consequences of a cyber attack if successful? Is it a matter of losing power in a certain region for a few hours? Is it a matter of destroying critical equipment? Or is it a matter of losing power all over our great nation for long periods of time? We simply don't know. Should the government write cybersecurity standards, in this case the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, because under current law the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or Council, is simply too slow? If so, where should we draw the line? Do we address the bulk power system? What about military installations? What about local distribution systems? What about rural electric co-ops within single state boundaries? How do we do those? What about Canada and Mexico? What are their views, giving the FERC authority for the first time to coordinate and regulate with these nations that aren't within our own boundaries? Can we enforce such regulations if we agree that they are in, in the interest of these two na three nations? What about the views of the Defense Department and the National Security Council? What do they think about giving FERC the authority that we are thinking about giving them? Whatever we do in this subcommittee and next week in the full committee, uh, this is certainly an issue that needs to be addressed. I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for addressing it. I want to welcome our witnesses today the distinguished subcommittee chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, the C distinguished chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee, Commission, and the other witnesses. I do want to say one thing, Mr. Chairman, before I yield back. Uh, it was my understanding that Mr. Kelleher was going to be on a panel by himself. I see that you have got him listed on a panel with non-elected officials. Uh, I think that is unacceptable. I, 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 if I had known that, was well, the way it was going to be, I would have objected strenuously. So I hope that uh, before you actually begin the hearing, we will give a uh, presidential appointee the courtesy that we have always given other appointees, and that is to testify um, by him, himself or herself. Would the gentleman uh, yield to sure. me? Sure. I, I thank the gentleman for uh, making those remarks and comments. and. Uh, would advise him that uh, in the interest of time, Mr. Kelleher has graciously agreed to be a part of the second panel, although he will be the first witness on that panel. Given the fact that we had the memorial um, um, today at the Pentagon uh, this morning and there is a, a subsequent one involving the House of Representatives at 1145 and the urgency of addressing this issue, this was the only morning we could do it. And given that urgency, Mr. Kelleher has graciously agreed to help us expedite our proceedings. 
by uh, allowing us just to have one panel of witnesses following uh, the statement that Mr. Langevin will make. Well, if and, it's and not, I thank him for that. And uh, but, but I, I, otherwise, I can assure the gentleman that we would have done as he suggests. Well, I appreciate the gentleman, the the, the uh, chairman's explanation. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barton. The uh, gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Melanson, is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Melanson waives his opening statement and will have three minutes added to his questioning time for the second panel of witnesses. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Rogers, is recognized for three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, happen to serve on the Intelligence Committee with Mr. Langevin, so I'm, I'm at least glad he is paying attention to this because I think he will bring a, a good perspective from that, uh, from that side of the House. And I'm not sure sometimes if it's a benefit or a, a hindrance being on that committee, and today I'm, I'm not sure either, because I, I worry a little bit that uh, at the speed of which we're, we're working here, you know, we, we watched through the creation of the Director of National Intelligence that we were trying to coordinate our activities and our resources. Uh, and in a bipartisan way in this Congress, we said, slow down. Uh, the exponential growth uh, was not necessarily serving the interests of national security. And our cyber infrastructure goes well beyond uh, the grid. And the grid is an incredibly important uh, part of that. Uh, protection and security apparatus, but it is a part of it. Uh, and we have lots of talent and lots of resources spread across the 16 intelligence agencies uh, and Department of Defense uh, who have spent some, some serious amount of time and accumulated intellectual capital necessary to defeat what we know as a growing threat. And it is from terrorist organizations, it is from extortionists, it is uh, joy riders on the, the, super, uh, the super highway, if you will, and it is certainly, uh, and very worrisome, more aggressive by nation states. And we see all of that activity growing exponentially. So the threat is very, very real. But my concern is we are doing a ready, shoot, aim approach to how we are going to solve this problem. Because what we are going to do, it, even if you give authorities, with that will go people and resources, and then they have to go back and try to find integration with the very organizations I just mentioned before. I am not sure that that is the right way to get where we want to go. And I, I want to commend all of you for working on this. I think it is a very, very important issue uh, and it is a serious issue. But I don't think creating a separate group through separate authorization is, is likely to get where we want to go in a timely manner. We have got resources. We have got coordination efforts already that we are trying to work through. And I think Mr. Langevin is certainly aware of those. Uh, and I'm not sure this helps it. As a matter of fact, in some cases, I think it might actually hinder it. So I hope that we take our time and slow down a little bit. I think it's great that we highlight the problem, uh, but the fact that we don't have representation from Department of Defense, from the National Security Council, from the intelligence community, quite frankly, from the DNI. I think the DNI should. These, these are exactly the issues of which the Director of National Intelligence by this Congress was was designated to help us move through some of these uh, integrated policy issues where there is a cross spectrum of resources. So I, uh, I, again, I hope the hearing is for informational purposes. I would not be in a hurry, Mr. Chairman, to, to pass a bill and throw, move it through the House without the full cooperation and coordination of those resources. I think it would be critical to the end here that we do this correctly. The gentleman. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank the gentleman for those remarks, and I agree with the gentleman completely. Uh, there is a great sense of urgency that we address this need, as our witnesses will tell us this morning. Um, on a bipartisan basis, we have constructed a discussion draft which addresses uh, the core concerns that have been brought to us. There are some open issues which I have identified. They will be discussed here as well this morning. We invited the Department of Defense to send a witness uh, to address the subcommittee this morning, and the Department of Defense declined to do that. Um, I can tell the gentleman that uh, we do intend to have a classified briefing for the oppor an opportunity offered to members for a classified briefing next week. And uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and the Director of Central Intelligence will be a part of that briefing. And so uh, the gentleman's uh, request uh, will be honored. I, I can tell him also that we intend to go through regular order in processing this legislation. Um, Assuming that we are in a position to resolve the outstanding issues, and I very much hope that we will be, 
Uh, we would like to move to a markup next week. That would be after the classified briefing takes place. Uh, if the issues are resolved, uh, to the satisfaction of members, I see no reason why we shouldn't do that, given the urgency that exists. Uh, and then hopefully we can move to the full committee rapidly after that and then to the House floor. But I respect uh, what the gentleman is saying, and, and he has expressed my view as well, that we need to be very careful as we construct this measure, and uh, we certainly intend to be. If, if the gentleman just yield further, it's, uh, I, I've had some discussions with the chairman and uh, Chairman Boucher on this issue, and I agree that we ought to have regular order here. There are, are a number of witnesses that are not on the list that ought to be here. Uh, just looking at the brief presentation that CNN made on the air, I want to say it was last year, uh, there are a number of folks, uh, Homeland Security Agency and others, that, that really ought to be represented. We need to do this right. It is critical. We need to get that. I, I don't have the, the luxury, as, as you have, uh, serving on the Intelligence uh, Committee, Mr. Langevin and others, and uh, as we are prepared to make sure that this is our level best, uh, we've got to have that input, which is one of the reasons why the chairman and I uh, thought it would be wise to have a classified briefing at the earliest uh, moment, which is since we don't have votes uh, next, uh, tomorrow uh, and uh, until yeah. Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning was the earliest time that we could do that yeah. uh, to afford all members on both sides of the aisle to be able to ask questions in a private way that will lend us a better understanding of the way that we should proceed and, and do it in the, in the right course. And I commend you for having that classified briefing. I think hopefully that will give us a different look at it. And I would understand why DOD might have a hard time here. Some of the things um, that our, our communities are working on are very, very sensitive. Uh, and be, because of the aggressive state of nation states involved in, in cyber espionage and cyber terrorism, I can understand why they might have some reluctance to come here and, and not be able to answer questions. Uh, it, it puts it in an awkward place. So I hope that we take the time to see uh, if, with this classified briefing. And I think it might help us all understand how, yes, it's important, but it's more important that we do it right than we do something. That's right. And your attendance there will help all of us uh, in terms of what you've been able to go through because of your experience on the Intelligence uh, Committee. I thank the gentleman for his contributions this morning. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'll waive an opening statement. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Walden. Uh, we now welcome our first witness this morning, the Honorable Jim Langevin uh, from Rhode Island, and we appreciate very much your attendance here. Uh, Mr. Langevin is the chairman of the Subcommittee on Emerging Threat, Cybersecurity, and Science and Technology of the Committee on Homeland Security. And I know from my discussions with him has been actively involved in examining the question of cybersecurity for uh, his tenure as chairman of that subcommittee. And he has uh, much useful information he can share with us this morning. So, Jim, we welcome you and your prepared statement will be made a part of the record and we would welcome your, uh, your oral remarks. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Boucher for his invitation to testify on uh, this critical issue. Jim, if you could move that microphone a little bit closer and be sure it's on, uh, that would help us uh, in hearing you. Thank you. Is that, uh, is that better? That is better. Very good. I want to thank uh, Chairman Boucher for his invitation to testify on this critical issue of national security. Uh, I very much appreciate the Chairman's interest and in that of uh, Ranking Member uh, Upton. Uh, and if their interest in cybersecurity relates to the electric grid. And I commend both of these gentlemen, the full committee uh, and its staff for their efforts in this area. I'd also like to thank Chairman Thompson of the Homeland Security Committee for his proactive uh, leadership on these issues as well. Mr. Chairman, as uh, you mentioned, I chair the Emerging Threats, Cybersecurity and Science and Technology Subcommittee for the Homeland uh, Security Committee where I've conducted eight hearings and dozens of investigations on cybersecurity issues during the 110th Congress. I'm also a member of the, uh, the House uh, Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and I co-chair the Center for Strategic and International Studies Commission on Cybersecurity for the 44th Presidency. Each of these positions has afforded me the opportunity to examine the issues that are before this committee today. Now, I, uh, I want to, to clearly state that I believe America is disturbingly vulnerable to a cyber attack against the electric grid that could cause significant consequences to our nation's critical infrastructure. 
Virtually every, aspect, virtually every expert I have consulted uh, shares this assessment. Though it cannot provide classified details at this hearing, I hope uh, that my testimony will support this assertion and encourage you to act on this legislation. The effective functioning uh, of the bulk uh, power system is highly dependent uh, on control systems, computer-based systems used to monitor and control sensitive processes and physical functions. Once largely closed to the outside world, control systems are increasingly connected to open networks, and the risk to these systems is steadily increasing. Consider what's happened in the last five years. Criminal extortion schemes have exploited control systems for economic gain. Numerous disruptions from the davis Bessey uh, power plant incident in, uh, in 2003 to the Northeast blackout to the Browns Ferry nuclear power plant failure in 2006 were caused by unintentional cyber incidents. Furthermore, the U.S. has evidence that al-Qaeda is interested in the vulnerabilities of our uh, public and private util utilities. Additionally, uh, nation state adversaries have uh, publicly stated that attacking our uh, domestic critical infrastructure, including the civilian electric grid, will be part of their war plans in an engagement with the United States. Clearly, intentional and unintentional control system failures on the BPS can have a potentially devastating impact on the economy, public health, and national security of the United States. Now, for a society that runs on power, the discontinuity of electricity to chemical plants, banks, refineries, hospitals, and water systems presents a terrifying scenario. These incidents would also severely impact our warfighting capability as recognized by the Defense Science Board. In the interest of national security, we must ensure effective and reliable energy flows to America's critical infrastructure facilities. With this in mind, my subcommittee initiated a review of the Federal Government's efforts and ability to ensure the security of the BPS uh, from cyber attack. Now, we became particularly concerned about the private sector's efforts to mitigate a vulnerability known as Aurora, which the Chairman mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, which, if exploited, could result in catastrophic losses of power for long periods of time. I was convinced of the seriousness of this vulnerability and began doing all I could to ensure that we were fixing it. In June 2007, the Electric Sector uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center produced a voluntary mitigation document for the industry. During my review of the Electric Sector mitiga mitigation efforts, however, it became evident that mitigation was highly inconsistent. I was surprised and, disturb and disturbed to see how dismissive many of the companies were of this vulnerability particularly given the significant technical evidence backing up the test. Even worse, uh, NERC, the private sector reliability organization, seemed uninterested uh, in, deter in determining the extent of industry compliance. Uh, NERC provided uh, false, uh, uh, confusing or misleading testimony to my subcommittee during our investigation. Now, NERC has since realized their mistakes, uh, corrected their testimony, and began demonstrating the leadership uh, that we expect. Nevertheless, I am still worried about the, the electric sector's approach towards timely mitigation of cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Now, in light of this, uh, this failure of, a, of initiative throughout the electric sector, my subcommittee made a formal request uh, of FERC to investigate uh, the extent to which owners and operators were implementing the Aurora mitigation efforts. Thankfully, uh, FERC has uh, demonstrated great initiative, and I want to take this opportunity uh, to, uh, to publicly thank Chairman Kelleher uh, and his staff uh, for their efforts. Uh, FERC's initial observations suggest that while no company completely ignored the advisory, there were varying degrees of compliance. At this time, the, uh, the subcommittee also requested that FERC assess its ability to respond to an imminent cyber attack under the current legal authorities contained in Section 215 of the Federal Power Act. In testimony before the subcommittee on May 21st, uh, Chairman Kelleher concluded uh, that additional authorities are necessary to adequately protect the BPS, and I fully support the Chairman's conclusion. In the interest of national security, uh, a uh, statutory mechanism is necessary to protect the, gr the grid uh, against cybersecurity threats. I congratulate the subcommittee for its legislative initiative, and I have several in uh, uh, comments on the draft legislation uh, that are before us. First, emergency standards should become uh, enforceable uh, upon a finding of a by a national security or intelligence uh, agency. I fear that additional uh, uh, executive determinations would create unnecessary delays in the protections of the BPS. Second, 
FERC should be authorized to act if either, one, a malicious act is likely to occur, occur or, two, there is a substantial possibility of disruption to the grid due to, uh, to such an act. Specific threat information on this subject is difficult to come by, and it will be very hard to put together likelihood and consequence. Uh, we must not limit the ability of our Federal agencies to act. Finally, I am concerned that the current legislation does not cover assets that are, at, that are outside the de definition of the bulk power system, which, uh, if left unprotected, uh, will keep our nation vulnerable. Uh, as uh, uh, the Committee is aware, and as the, the Chairman had referred to, the Federal Power Act leaves vulnerable uh, Alaska, Hawaii, and many other, uh, uh, many major cities uh, like D.C. and New York, uh, and the nation's critical infrastructures, uh, like our military installations, because they don't fall under the definition uh, of the BPS. Generation, transmission, and distribution must be protected under this legislation, and I would ask the Committee to consider an amendment that would allow FERC to address cyber uh, threats against all of these areas. Now, in closing, on this day when we vow to be vigilant, uh, vigilant in protecting the country against threats of all kinds, let nobody accuse us of having a September 10th mindset when it comes to cybersecurity. With that, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Langevin. We appreciate that uh, testimony, and uh, your comments this morning will prove very helpful to us as we proceed with our work. Uh, I do not have questions of you, uh, at least not at this time. We may consult you as we proceed with uh, further steps in this process, but I do not have questions of you at this moment. I would ask if there are other members of the panel who would care to pose questions to Mr. Langevin. Mr. Upton would uh, seeks recognition. I, I just have one, and Jim, we appreciate your, your testimony, your, your work on this uh, for sure. You indicated in your your statement that you feared that the presidential secretarial determination as currently provided in the draft legislation would create an unnecessary delay in the protection of the BPS. Uh, but you've got to have a chain of command. You've got to, and uh, FERC, one, one of the issues that, that may be raised is, is uh, FERC is certainly the appropriate agency overseeing uh, the grid and, and all of that, but shouldn't you have someone at the White House or someone at the, the Pentagon, uh, someone, uh, perhaps the Secretary of Energy, someone with direct, not, not that our good friend Joe doesn't have access uh, to folks like that, but should, shouldn't you have some White House command uh, similar to what happened on 9-11 when the FAA ruled uh, because of Secretary Mineta that all the planes were going to stop wherever they were. That, that came in direct consultation with the White House. Uh, and bingo, it happened. Shouldn't you have that type of chain of control, chain of command uh, as, as part of the legislation, which seems to be one of the, the uh, criticisms that you might have here? Well, or am that's I misreading true. what your, your comments were? Uh, that's true, but certainly the, the Secretary of Homeland Security can declare a, uh, uh, a national emergency. Yeah, and then that would be appropriate, these, too. And, and these, these lines, but uh, we have to understand that in this day and age of, of cyber uh, security, cyber attacks, uh, it's one thing if we had uh, days to, uh, uh, to go through the process of uh, uh, ultimately getting a presidential directive in place. But when we have actionable intelligence, these type of cyber attacks, uh, cyber threats, uh, could actually come uh, in, in seconds or minutes or, or hours. And, uh, and when we have uh, direct actionable intelligence, uh, there should be uh, a, uh, a, a rapid ability to respond, and I'm concerned about unnecessary delays. Uh, even if these, this directive authority that I'm suggesting that FERC would be given uh, would be temporary in nature until a more permanent solution can be uh, uh, addressed, would be fine. But I think that the, we have to uh, recognize in, in this day and age of cyber, things don't, never, don't move in days or weeks, they move in seconds. Okay. Are, are you back? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Upton. Mr. Langevin, we appreciate your attendance here this morning. And we will move now to our second panel of witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We are pleased to welcome on uh, the second panel the Chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Mr. Uh, Joe Kelleher, uh, Mr. Kevin Colliver, the Assistant Secretary of the United States Department of Energy, uh, Mr. Rick Sergel, the President of the North American Reliability Corporation, Susan Kelly, 
Vice President and General Counsel of the American Public Power Association, Steve Nauman, Vice President of the Exelon Corporation, and Barry Lawson, Manager of Power Delivery for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. We welcome each of our witnesses and thank you for your attendance this morning. And uh, your prepared written statements will be made a part of our record. We would welcome your oral summaries and ask that in the interest of time you try to keep your oral summaries to approximately five minutes. Uh, we are going to operate slightly out of order this morning because both Mr. Kelleher and Mr. Colliver uh, have expressed uh, a need to depart rather quickly in order to attend to some rather urgent outside business. And so we are going to take their opening statements first. We will ask questions of them and uh, then we will proceed to the opening statements and questions of our, the balance of our witnesses. And so uh, with that understanding, uh, Mr. Kelleher, we will be happy to hear from you and then from Mr. Colliver. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Boucher. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Upton, members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the invitation to testify here today and I want to say it's good to be back before the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the need to improve cybersecurity and to protect the reliability of the power grid against cyber attacks and other national security threats. Three years ago, Congress made FERC responsible for protecting the reliability of the power grid by establishing and enforcing mandatory reliability standards. Congress specifically directed FERC to develop cybersecurity standards to protect the grid and we have done so. But I'm here today to offer my conclusion that the tools you gave us three years ago are inadequate to the task and that FERC needs additional legal authority to, to adequately protect the grid from cyber attacks and other national security threats. There's been much progress made on reliability over the past three years. FERC has certified an electric reliability organization. We've established mandatory reliability standards including cyber standards. We are working to improve those standards over time to raise the bar and we've established a reliability and enforcement regime. But the grid remains vulnerable to a cyber attack through communications devices that could secure access, control and remote operation of key components of our electricity system such as large generating facilities, substations, transmission lines and local distribution facilities. And that through remote operation a cyber attack could damage or destroy generation and other facilities. And because an attack could damage or destroy facilities that could take weeks or longer to replace, the effects of a successful cyber attack could be much greater than a blackout. In my view, an effective defense of the power grid from cyber attacks has three necessary elements. First, there is a need for timely and effective identification of cyber vulnerabilities. Second, there is a need to have an ability to require mandatory actions that mitigate those vulnerabilities on a timely basis, so action that is both rapid and, and mandatory. And third, an ability to maintain the confidentiality of information and that I believe current law is inadequate to mount such a defense. FERC is not a national security or intelligence agency and FERC is not in the best position to identify cyber threats. But the U.S. government has the ability to identify cyber threats in a timely and effective manner and FERC does cooperate with agencies uh, that are in that position including the Department of Energy. However, there is no adequate means to take mandatory action in, in a timely manner under, under existing law. Currently, there are two means to protect the power grid against cyber attacks. The, the 215 process established by Congress in the Energy Policy Act of 2005 and also NERC advisories. But in my view, neither is adequate to defend against cyber attacks. The 215 process produces reliability standards that are mandatory but untimely given the nature of cyber threats and that NERC advisories are timely or can be timely, but they are also voluntary and both approaches fail to protect critical information. FERC is using and will continue to use the process established by 215 of the Federal Power Act to set reliability standards including cyber standards. But the principal flaw of the 215 process is that it takes too long and does not allow for, for the protection of critical information. Under the normal 215 process, it typically takes years to, de to develop new and modified reliability standards, including cyber standards. And that even reliability standards developed under the urgent action process can take months or longer. Also, FERC cannot modify a proposed standard. We can reject or remand or approve and direct changes that will occur over time. But if we reject a standard, it just simply reinitiates a process that could take months or years. 
Why is there a need for timely action in this area? It is simply because the cyber threat is different from other reliability threats. The Section 215 process was designed around a fundamentally different reliability challenge, namely re vegetation management or tree growth, relay maintenance, grid control operations, operator training. The reliability threat posed by trees and poor vegetation management is a passive threat, while the threat posed by, uh, by cyber attacks is organized and much more active. The nature of the cyber threat is different. It is a national security threat that may be posed by foreign countries or organized groups, and that a process designed to guard against poor vegetation management is poorly suited to meet national security threats. There's another limitation in that Section 215 only authorizes FERC to ultimately establish standards, and that some cyber threats or other national security threats may require action that are not standards. NERC advisories also, I think, are an inadequate way to, to assure cyber security, to, to protect cyber security. The principal virtue of a NERC advisory is speed, but the principal flaw is that compliance with, with those advisories is voluntary, and there is a lack of confidentiality. The advisory issued last year in response to the <laughs> NERC issued an advisory last year in response to the Aurora cyber threat. And I commend NERC for acting, acting quickly in response to that threat. And as detailed in my written testimony, FERC has been reviewing the industry response to that advisory. And I have to say the industry has made progress in response to the NERC advisory, and I think cybersecurity is higher as a result. But our review indicates that the industry response has not mitigated the Aurora threat and that to some extent that response is the predictable result of reliance on a voluntary advisory. Now confidentiality, I think it's also clear an effective defense against cyber threats requires confidentiality. That the standards development process under Section 215 of the Federal Power Act typically imposes few or no restrictions on the dissemination of information related to the development of new standards, including cyber standards. And that in the case of cyber vulnerabilities, public release of information related to cybersecurity could be very harmful. And that FERC currently has very limited authority to, to uh, limit the dissemination, public dissemination of information. So in my view, I think there is a need for legislation. I think Section 215 of the Federal Power Act is an adequate basis to address reliability threats other than national security threats, such as cyber attack. But I, and I, do, for that reason, do not believe that Section 215 should be amended. But I believe there's a need for legislation that would grant FERC a separate authorization to, number one, immediately require measures to address known cyber vulnerabilities such as Aurora, uh, related to Aurora, and two, require mandatory actions needed to protect the power grid from future national security threats on an interim basis after a finding by the President or the Secretary of Energy. I think under this approach, it's clear FERC cannot act with respect to future cyber other national security threats without such a finding by the President or the Secretary. So it, I think it, that appropriately limits us uh, and relies on the, the superior um, knowledge of the President and the Secretary with respect to national security threats. But it's also vital that a bill allow FERC to take action before a cyber attack and not only after the fact. It's critical that the threshold or trigger for a finding by the President or the Secretary not be so high as to be insurmountable. And I think the trigger in the proposed staff discussion draft is appropriate. And I think there's also a need to address national security threats other than cyber. So I just want to say I do support the staff discussion draft. I think it does strike the right balance, but I, I look forward to working with the subcommittee as you move towards markup. And I do recognize the Department of Energy has a proposal that I think also should be considered as you move to markup in coming days. But in conclusion, you gave us a duty three years ago to protect reliability of the power grid, to establish and enforce reliability standards. We're exercising that duty, but we've come to the conclusion that we don't have the right tools to address the cyber threat. And the reason is that the nature of the threat, the reliability threat to the grid, is different than perhaps was anticipated three and a half years ago. And so I, I do ask you to act and legislate. But until and unless you do that, FERC will use existing authorities and NERC will use existing authorities. We'll use the tools we have as best we can. And with that, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kelleher. Mr. Uh, Colliver, we'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today on this critically important matter. Um, let me just note at the beginning that, uh, as you would expect, the chairman 
uh, and I and our staff uh, have discussed this issue on a number of occasions. I'd like to associate myself with his remark. I think that as we move forward, you'll find broad agreement between the Department of Energy and the FERC. This hearing addresses more than just a reliability concern. It addresses a national security concern. The Department of Energy and FERC and the electric sector must work cooperatively toward eliminating cyber vulnerabilities in control systems and preventing malicious cyber attacks on our electric infrastructure. Our nation's electric power grid must be better protected. We must harden our power system. The Department of Energy regularly discovers new vulnerabilities in the control systems employed by many utilities. This is not hyperbole. Let me assure you that cyber attacks against control systems have occurred and they are becoming increasingly sophisticated. The Director of National Intelligence only underscored these concerns when he acknowledged earlier this year that cyber exploitation has not only grown more sophisticated, but more targeted and more serious. Embedded processors and controllers in critical sectors are being targeted for exploitation and potentially for disruption or destruction with increasing frequency by a growing number of adversaries, not all of whom are in the pay of foreign governments. According to one senior CIA analyst, some cyber intrusions into utilities have been followed by extortion demands. Cyber attacks have been used to disrupt power equipment in regions outside the United States. And in at least one case, a cyber-based disruption caused an outage that affected multiple cities. Let me for a moment drill down on one point, and th this actually speaks to uh, Congressman Rogers' point. The following text is drawn from the intelligence community assisting us in pr preparation of this draft. For a nation state to execute a coordinated attack across the nation with certainty at a point in time chosen to have geopolitical or military effect would require considerable planning and would require sustained access during an extensive preparation period to numerous points in the control systems that help operate the national grid. Planning this type of attack would require extensive collection of information, expertise on both uh, cyber and power systems, probably some type of extensive modeling effect to be uh, sure of the effect, and then gaining and maintaining access to the actual target systems. Even maintaining reliable clandestine access requires resources and constant attention because system software and configurations change over time, and the adversary must be careful not to tip his hand with obvious activity. Gaining initial access to particular systems may require the recruitment of insiders or conducting supply chain atta attacks which might require months or years of preparation. Even gathering the necessary detailed information needed to identify targets and possible points of access may require some form of long-term clandestine operations. As a matter of risk management, we need to make sure that we are not facilitating each of these critical steps for our adversaries by leaving ourselves open to collection of target information, open to easy access and reconnaissance, and reconnaissance or vulnerable by by virtue of leaving systems misconfigured or unpatched. The Departments of Energy and Homeland Security have been working with industry to increase awareness and to help make industry, uh, help industry make sensible risk management choices. And Mr. Chairman, I think this also speaks to the confidential, uh, confidentiality requirements that the Chairman mentioned. To be clear, however, notwithstanding the many difficulties associated with the execution of a very serious cyber attack on the electric sector, the potential consequences are significant. For that reason, a limited role for the federal government is warranted if the nation's energy infrastructure is to be protected. The department has been substantively engaged on this issue for some time. In 2003, DOE's Office of Energy Assurance, the predecessor program to the Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability, was designated to work directly with the energy owners and operators to protect energy infrastructures from all hazards and make them become more resilient. DOE does this by selectively conducting vulnerability assessments and applying sound risk management practices at critical facilities, and we implement physical and cyber solutions to mitigate the risks based on the vulnerabilities we identify. To date, the Department and its national laboratories have conducted testbed and on-site field assessments of 15 common control systems used widely across the energy sector. These assessments have revealed vulnerabilities ranging in severity from minimal to high impact. With 17 testing facilities from five Department of Energy National Laboratories, we are also constantly leveraging an extensive intelligence gathering network, proven methodologies, and highly skilled professionals from across the national security and intelligence communities, in particular DHS, to assess and interpret threat information. Nevertheless, we need to do more and be thoughtful. 
The cyber threat to electric power systems is certainly among the most critical in our nation's infrastructure. However, cyberspace has become critical to all of our other infrastructures as well, with potential national security, economic and safety concerns. As a nation, we need to make sure that we are addressing risk management across all of our infrastructures in a holistic manner and that we not solve one problem only to create new problems or restrain solutions elsewhere. As a result, we believe any legislation should be carefully coordinated across the executive branch. We need to move expeditiously to protect the power grid, but let's get this right. The administration is continuing to examine what additional authorities are appropriate for DOE and the FERC. To the extent that Congress acts in this area, we recommend that it consider the following. Allow the FERC to establish interim reliability standards for the purpose of rapidly responding to specific electric sector vulnerabilities. When presented with a credible cyber threat against the bulk power system, such interim reliability standards could provide an effective bridge until being replaced by cybersecurity reliability standards developed, approved and implemented pursuant to Section 215. With respect to potential measures in the face of an imminent threat to the bulk power system, allow the Department of Energy to issue an order for immediate remedial action. That order could stand until new FERC interim standards or standards developed pursuant to Section 215 were put into place. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my statement. I'm prepared to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Culliver. Uh, Mr. Kelleher, I'm going to direct my questions to you, um, and uh, I would appreciate uh, your turning, uh, if, if you have the information there, to the audit which the FERC conducted of the 1,200 entities connected to the bulk power system that uh, received the FERC advisory uh, recommending certain steps that should be taken to enhance protection against cybersecurity threats and outlining a schedule of either 90 days in the case of some steps or 180 days in the case of other steps by which uh, those protections should be put in place. Uh, you audited uh, uh, a number of the, those 1,200 entities. Uh, as I recall, that number was 30. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, with regard to those 30 audited companies, how many did you find that were, uh, at the time of your audit, in full compliance? with the advisory that had been issued by the NERC? Seven of the 30, sir. So seven of the 30 were in full compliance. Uh, of the remaining 23, uh, had some of those taken some steps uh, toward compliance uh, but were not in full compliance, or were there uh, any among those 23 that had taken no steps at all? I believe all of the 23 took some steps. Uh, it varied on how many they took. How many would you classify based on your audit as still being vulnerable to the Aurora vulnerability determined by the Idaho Laboratory? Well, that's a more difficult question because we don't think the advisory by itself necessarily would, full compliance with the advisory itself wouldn't, in our view, wouldn't necessarily mitigate the Aurora threat. So you're really asking, um, the question really is who went, which companies went beyond the advisory to uh, take steps uh, broader than what NERC had recommended. And that, we would say, two of the 30 um, had, had mitigated the Aurora threat. Leaving uh, 28 still vulnerable in FERC's view? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Um, talk a little bit about um, what you found in terms of the compliance schedules that had been adopted by the various utilities. Did some of them have uh, truly extraordinary schedules extending over many years uh, as compared to the NERC advisory, which was that these steps be put in place with 100, within 180 days? Yes, sir. And I think there was some uh, confusion in some of the companies between the timelines in the NERC advisory and the scope of facilities affected, covered by the NERC advisory, with the rules that the Commission issued, the, the cyber standards that the Commission approved in January, which envisioned a longer time frame than the NERC advisory. And some companies uh, incorrectly assume that the longer timelines in the FERC rule govern their compliance with the NERC, the NERC advisory. So they really didn't understand the NERC advisory? Some of them did not certainly understand the timelines of that where their actions were supposed to take place. 
All right. Um, did you find that there were utilities that had done little uh, uh, or nothing in compliance with the NERC advisory other than simply preparing with the FERC interview? That was a part of your audit. Uh, they were, uh, they very readily in, in participated in our review. So I think the industry gets credit for very openly participating. Uh, they did ask for some confidentiality, and because they're providing this information voluntarily, we agreed to that. Uh, I think, um, uh, in some cases, I don't think there was a sufficient understanding of, of what facilities really should be covered by the NERC advisory. I think companies thought they could freely determine that facilities were not part of the bulk power system, were, there, were therefore not covered by the advisory, and then shrink the scope of facilities where they might have to act to protect cybersecurity. Uh, in other cases, there was a lack of appreciation for um, the, the, the communication among their facilities. Many, and really most, electric facilities are capable of remote operation. And some utilities thought that um, they didn't seem to appreciate the, how interconnected some of their facilities were. Uh, and so I gather from that answer that there were utilities that incorrectly assumed that their equipment uh, was not vulnerable to the Aurora vulnerability when, in fact, you uh, could readily see that that equipment was subject to that vulnerability. Yes, sir. Um, did you find any entities that excluded um, uh, critical assets uh, from the implementation to the extent they were implementing the NERC uh, advisory? Uh, that should have, in fact, uh, been covered and, and, and been a part of that implementation? Yes, sir. We think some facilities should have been included that were not. Let me ask for uh, your reasoning, briefly stated, on uh, some of the key issues that we have detected as uh, remaining outstanding, uh, where there is some difference of opinion among uh, interested parties with regard uh, to the discussion draft that, that we have put forward. Uh, specifically, the definition of uh, what constitutes a cybersecurity threat, uh, whether or not the authority that is extended to the FERC should go beyond uh, protecting against cybersecurity attacks to protecting against uh, physical attacks uh, to those facilities, uh, whether or not, um, I'm sorry, the conditions under which there should be a sunset on the emergency powers that would be granted upon a presidential or secretary of energy designated uh, emergency. Um, and, and then finally, the scope of the authority granted to you in terms of its basic coverage, should it extend beyond the continental bulk power system to the states of Alaska and Hawaii, should it extend to major distribution systems in our largest cities, such as uh, New York and Washington, D.C. So, uh, and I, I realize that's a question that could occupy a half hour in response. What I'm asking for is maybe a three-minute response. Okay. If you, if you I will do, do my best. In Thank terms you. of threshold, I, I think the threshold in the bill is appropriate. I think it, it, if, it, if the threshold is set so high that it's all virtually impossible for the President or the Secretary to make a threat determination, then it's probably better not to legislate in the first place because you'll end up with a, a statute that becomes somewhat of a dead letter. Uh, with respect to scope of facilities, we have we think the scope is appropriate, but it's important for the subcommittee to understand that it's not true that the only cyber threat to the U.S. electricity system is uh, directed at bulk power, the bulk power system. It can be directed towards other transmission facilities that are not part of the bulk power system. It can be directed towards local distribution facilities. In part, we we support the current scope. Because from FERC's point of view, that's what you entrusted to us three and a half years ago. You said, FERC, you are responsible to assure reliability of the bulk power system, not the entire electricity system in the United States. <laughs> and so we're sticking with what you entrusted to us three years ago. So we think that that scope is appropriate, but we recognize we, we don't want the subcommittee to think that's the only part of the U.S. electricity system that's at risk. Uh, you had four questions. That's only two of them. The um, Well, uh, also the... Uh, uh, whether or not the conditions under which there could be a sunset on the emergency sunset, powers. I, I frankly don't think a sunset is appropriate because we're talking about emergency powers and national security law. And FERC isn't usually associated with um, emer emergency powers. But I think a sunset is just inconsistent with the exercise of emergency power. Design. Well, if the emergency subsides, then obviously 
the powers associated with addressing that emergency would no longer be necessary. Yes, sir. Uh, but I think I don't. Part of it is uh, how lightly do you think the president or the secretary of energy would be to, to declare a threat? And I think if the threat subsided, I think the president and the secretary would be pretty ready to acknowledge that the threat had subsided, and then the FERC action would terminate. Well, it sounds like your answer to that question is upon a presidential or secretary of energy determination that the threat has ended, because some of the other proposals would have automatic termination yes, upon a period of one year, yes, uh, as an example, unless the emergency was renewed by affirmative action of the executive. The and so your, your thought on that would be what? I, I think a sunset is inconsistent with, uh, I, I think it is workable. I think it is inconsistent generally with national security law and, and the exercise of emergency powers. And you had one more question I haven't gotten to, sir, but I have. Uh, the, defi the definition of uh, what constitutes an emergency. Okay. And that was. A and, and, and the notion of substantiality as a part of the statutory definition. I, we support the or configuration, not the and configuration, because we think the and configuration just sets the bar too high. That's too limiting. Yes, sir. You. All right. Thank you. One other question I have. Yes, sir. Did you estimate while you were undertaking your audit of entities attached to the bulk power system what the cost? of uh, complying with the FERC advisory would be uh, for the typical attached entity. Um, that is a key consideration. If it is a minor cost, then there would be little reason uh, for uh, noncompliance to have occurred, certainly to the extent that it did. If it is a major cost, uh, then obviously a different set of considerations begin to apply, and, and that would uh, necessarily affect time frames that you would want to have in your order or that we might want to have in the statute for obtaining compliance. So the question of cost is relevant. As a part of your audit, did you address that question? And if so, do you have an estimate of what the cost of compliance per covered facility would be? We do not have a good estimate of what the cost of compliance would be. One, uh, one aspect of FERC being the, the actor in this uh, area is that FERC is a race agency and we can provide for cost recovery. And I think that's an important consideration to industry. And we don't regulate all parts of the electricity industry, but Sue, I wanted to make sure that Sue Kelly um, heard it, me say it, that. It, it is an important <laughs> concern to industry, but a larger concern that we take into consideration is the ultimate cost to the energy user yes, sir. as well. Yes, and sir. cost recovery simply shifts it downward uh, I agree. to the ultimate user, and, and that is something we, we would need to consider. So yes, one thing that I, I would be very interested in learning, and perhaps other witnesses in their opening statements uh, could address this, is the what that estimated cost would be. My time has been grossly exceeded here. Mr. Kelleher, you have been very helpful. Uh, I thank you and recognize the gentleman from Michigan for his questions. Thank you again uh, for your testimony uh, this morning. I, uh, I do have a, a couple of questions. And I, for me, again, I, I am very anxious for our classified briefing uh, with perhaps a few more parties that, that can help, um, help us uh, with this issue so that we can appropriately so uh, come up with the absolute best vehicle. And, of course, as I think back, it, uh, it was the blackout through much of uh, the Midwest that really prompted uh, the 05 bill. That was the engine that drove the train, uh, bringing about those reliability standards, which uh, passed on a pretty broad bipartisan basis. Remember, both Mr. Dingle and Mr. Barton had key roles. Uh, they both supported the bill. The same thing was in the Senate. I was a part of that conference, and we are glad to see it happen. And I guess if I had to use an analogy, uh, I raised uh, about the FAA towers, uh, the FAA control uh, back on 9-11 uh, today, ordering all the planes uh, to come down. In, in essence, you all can send out advisories, uh, but you can't enforce what you have to say. So it would be uh, very much uh, along what, Ameri what American Airlines was told a few months ago when they, they literally had to shut down their airline as they had to rebundle all of those wiring packages. Uh, in their planes uh, because the advisory came out and those planes couldn't fly until it was done. And in essence, you're, uh, I would think that uh, we need to make sure that you have the power to, to uh, as you issue those advisories, to make sure that they're completed in a timely manner. And in, in uh, uh, response to Mr. Boucher's uh, question about costs, I suppose as part of that advisory, you could ask the utilities what they anticipate those costs to be. That is that not 
something that you do now then in terms of the advisories that go out or not? Certainly with respect to any action we take to mitigate the aurora threat, that would be through notice and comment rulemaking and the industry would raise, certainly raise cost in the context of that rulemaking. The, um, what, what type of trigger would, I mean, as, as, as we think about uh, Jim Lingvin, our, our colleague who spoke earlier in terms of the chain of command and one of the issues that he raised was it may happen so fast, cyber seconds, you may not have time to go to the whatever chain of command that you have, whether it be the NSA, the President, the Secretary of Energy. Uh, uh, what type of, you know, a pre-trigger uh, would you suggest uh, uh, be employed for you to, to, I would suppose, what, shut down a utility or shut down part of the grid to make sure that it doesn't expand? Is that the type of threat that you would envision would happen? It, um, it's hard to, let me try to come up with a hypothetical that, that could try to um, put it in place. Let's, and I don't, hypotheticals are sometimes useful, sometimes not, sometimes not helpful, but I'll take the risk. But let's assume that the Department of Energy or the President or somewhere in the um, national security agencies, they identified uh, some threat to substations in a city. There was some effort to uh, destroy substations. And the President or Secretary made uh, a finding consistent with the statute that there's a credible, I actually don't remember the exact words, but the President or the Secretary made a finding consistent with the statute. FERC would not be in a position to make that finding because we're not an intelligence agency, but upon that finding we could theoretically identify where there are spare transformers in the country. We could theoretically order them to be relocated to that metropolitan area in anticipation of a possible attack. And we could also allow for cost recovery for the uh, owners of those transformers if they are regulated entities. And we could try to come up with a creative approach to address cost recovery if they're not. <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of thing that conceivably we could do under this scenario. Uh, we also, in an urban area, we could order generators to have higher spinning, to uh, operate their system differently, to basically have more generation on call in the event some facilities were damaged or um, destroyed. So there's operational changes that we could order. We could order the relocation of spare transformers, and there would be other hypotheticals as well. That would take time, though. I mean, that, that would actually be a, something, I mean, by the time you locate a generator and move it to the right spot, I mean, it could but Not the second one. The ordering a uh, generators to have higher spinning reserve levels, that's something that could be done immediately. As I, you know, as, as I think about what happened back in 05, I mean, remember, remember, I'm from Michigan, so yes, go like this. Uh, and <laughs> I live over here, and we have uh, two nuclear plants. And I can remember one of our plants, the Palisades plants. They, they were within within less than a minute of shutting that facility down because of the drain on the network from Columbus and Ohio and, and other places just was uh, sucking the the power through the grid and. Had they shut that plant down, it would have gone right around the horn over to Chicago and it would have been even far worse. So uh, they had to make the decision as to whether they're going to keep it online and thank goodness uh, they didn't have to hit the shutoff button, which who knows how long it would have, t would have been much longer, much uh, more in, in damages in terms of what would have happened. But, but that was their own independent decision as to whether they were going to and that I think was Consumers Energy then owned it. It could have been Energy, but it was that uh, it was that nuclear plant that that because it stayed on actually prevented it from going and hitting even more of the Midwest uh, than what happened. But as I recall, that was their own independent decision. It wasn't FERC that told them to shut it down or, or somebody else. And I don't know if the 05 Act would would change that. Who would enforce it? I mean, what? If it was a cyber act, you'd think that, again, it would be pretty, uh, whoever the president would be would, would take almost immediate action to try and prevent damages or loss from expanding beyond perhaps individual facilities, which would trigger a, a even broader blackout for who knows how long. I mean, that kind of scenario in terms of the 2003 blackout, that that might, I'm not familiar with the particular circumstances of that nuclear plant, but that's something that could be covered by the reliability standards that the Commission approved a year and a half ago. But if 
Uh, but who would give that order? I mean, would you be? Able, are you able to now to enforce? I think to take well, some enforcement action. I can't say with certainty that there is a rel current reliability standard that would govern the decision by a nuclear plant whether or not to continue to operate, because nuclear plants uh, there are standards that the NRC establishes the governing loss of offsite power, and nuclear plants uh, I think some they I think they generally do shut down when they lose offsite power. Uh, so uh, we have. We have tried to sync up our reliability standards with NRC standards, and we wouldn't want to interfere with NRC safety standards. Yeah, I wonder if we should have the NRC as a participant in our meeting next week. Probably yeah. should. So I've gone beyond my time as well. So I, I, Mr. I, Chairman, I, if I can respond to the to the Congressman's question as well, the the situation when we look at this, there are really probably three situations that that we need to think about when we're talking about threats to the to the grid uh, and then and then uh, immediate reliability implications and long-term reli reliability implications congressman I, I think the situation you describe is really um, falls into the latter category uh, those are actions that uh, that the utilities would take or, or that the operators at that nuclear facility would take um, as a result of the standards development process when we are looking at the the draft legislation, uh, today at, at the Department of Energy, we really see two other scenarios. One is uh, you have a credible threat, probably against a specific facility or, uh, or a portion of the grid that requires immediate action. Um, the Department of Energy does exercise some similar emergency uh, authorities uh, for the purposes of interconnection in particular. and. Uh, that can be issued in about an hour. I think the FERC actually has some similar authorities to 202C that, that are able to be executed very quickly. The second, so that's your imminent, immediate threat to which the federal government must take action and respond and give direction to the sector. The second is the situation that I think um, it, Aurora exemplifies, and that is you have a vulnerability. But the, le but, but the risk of exploitation of that vulnerability is relatively low. You don't have a player, you don't have a time, you don't have a specific threat. Uh, and, and in that type of situation, um, it, that, that does speak to an interim authority uh, at the FERC to, over a period of 90 days, 120 days, six months, whatever it is that the, the commission and the utilities decide is, is most appropriate, to speak to that threat and identify the interim standards that are going to be employed to ensure that that threat can't be exploited. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Upton. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, is recognized Thank for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it's appropriate we're having this hearing today because I think for some of us this issue really came to life in a post-9-11 environment, some of the briefings that we had at that time. And for those of us in the West with the long interconnection ties, I, I, I think of my district in Oregon where we ship the power from the hydro system through it, through those big DC converter lines down to California and all, that there are enormous vulnerabilities and opportunities for mischief, uh, if, if uh, not downright destruction. And, and I guess, Ms. Keller, I'd, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. One involves this, and I, I've had no classified briefings on this, so if I stumble into an area I don't belong, that's uh, shut me down, that's fine. But, but it would seem to me that, that if there's a cyber threat, is the issue that they can do a phase shift then and, and modify the, the, uh, the, the, the power itself and cause uh, disruption in the transformers? Is that part of it? Can they do voltage spikes that blow up the transformers? I mean, what sorts of issues do we need to be aware of here? Uh, it's probably better to say they can cause physical damage and and actually destroy facilities like transformers, and they, there's different ways they can, um, okay. a cyber attack could affect that damage. And then it, when it comes to the destruction of transformers, because that could be done with a explosive device, I mean today somebody could go out to one of those substations and, and do damage. Have we in the, in the interceding seven years um, taken stock of sort of our transformer uh, uh, supply uh, because my understanding is that it could take months, if not perhaps longer than that, to replace uh, some of these transformers if you had to start over from scratch and build them. Is that correct? 
It, we have taken the first steps at FERC to encourage the development of spare transformers. Okay. Because, as you say, transformers, uh, they can take months, perhaps a year or longer, actually, to manufacture. And there generally are not very many spare transformers in the United States. They're very expensive. They're very expensive. So we have uh, issued an order that would provide for cost recovery to the extent regulated companies develop spare right. transformers so that they could then be pooled to some extent for use. And, and do you know are the companies taking advantage of that? I don't know the status of whether there has been an increase in the uh, purchase of transformers and, there, and whether we've been allowed. I think we, we, we have an order that allows for cost recovery. I don't know what has followed the issuance of our order. So I can like. see an oversight hearing uh, post some event where we question the utilities about why they didn't take advantage of that and have at least some sort of backup. I realize you're not going to have one for one. I, I fully understand that. But it would seem to me that's an area where we would need backup. Because isn't the alternative that the grid could be down for a long period of time? There, there can be. Da certain facilities can be damaged or destroyed, and that is different than a blackout scenario where you can recover relatively quickly. Um, recovery could take longer in the wake of a successful cyber attack. Or a physical attack. Yes, sir. Either one. So it would seem to me that, one, we need to, to investigate more in terms of where utilities are in backup transformers, because that just seems logical to me, just as you have generators ready to go in case there's a hurricane in somewhere or any other disaster. Um, th this notion of having backup transformers would would certainly make sense. And I, uh, um, OK. The, the, this other issue about having to have a presidential declaration and all, uh, it, it would strike me, and, and perhaps, Mr. Culliver, you, you can address this as well, um, that if a utility or a grid manager got word that there's some potential cyber attack, wouldn't they want to react instantly to, to, take, to, to stop any damage to their systems? I would expect they would. And, and, and I heard some reference here that it could take upwards of an hour perhaps? Why would it take that long even? Oh, uh, the, uh, the, your question goes to, to the actions that the utility right. on information. Like shutting down a nuclear would, plant. Would or, uh, my experience with the electric sector is they would take immediate actions to protect their system. They do that now when, when they have anomalies on the grid. To the extent that you're talking about an emergency order issued by the federal government, and, and for, for our purposes, we think the analogous order is a, a Section 202C uh, order under the Federal Power Act, where the Secretary of Energy finds that an emergency exists uh, in, in the sector, um, and that might be because of a natural disaster, the less hurricanes that hit in 2005 right. uh, caused one, or we have a reliability emergency, which was the case in the order that was issued for the, the local Merritt plant on the Potomac River. Uh, to, to say that, that where there is a need to act quickly uh, with federal orders uh, speaking to the operation of, uh, of a system, th that there is a history of the federal government uh, moving very quickly uh, from administration to administration uh, in, in preparing and releasing an order to the electric sector uh, to, uh, to respond and, uh, accordingly. All right. Mr. Chairman, I know my time's expired, and I know we've been joined by my colleague from Illinois, so I would uh, thank you for your uh, indulgence. Thank you very much, Mr. Walden. The gentleman from Illinois uh, is uh, welcomed to the subcommittee today, and uh, Mr. Shimkus is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was uh, on the floor, as you know, fighting for coal. Um, thought you'd appreciate that. Did you bring some with you? Uh, right here. That, that, that. It's good Southern Illinois coal. Just well, we like talked about coal a lot in this subcommittee. I'm not aware we've ever actually had it here before. Uh, uh, well, I, I thank we, the gentleman. We need we need a new a good electric grid to uh, for all that Illinois coal to be used in uh, electricity generation and spread to lower prices for all over the country, uh, Chairman. Um, I am unprepared to follow up with concise questions, so I'll just yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, you'll have your opportunity on the second panel, and uh, I thank uh, the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Kelleher, did you care to make another remark? Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to clarify my earlier comments about the sunset. I do think generally a sunset is inconsistent with the use of emergency powers, but FERC has, in our discussions with industry groups, with others, we have agreed to a sunset 
for um, in the East Sarah where there would be a presidential finding or finding by the Secretary. FERC would be directed to act. We've agreed to a one-year sunset in the course of discussions in order to develop the broadest possible consensus. So I just wanted to clarify my uh, comments on sunset. And then on the question, uh, Mr. Kelleher, of the basic powers that the statute would confer upon FERC, that would not be subject to a sunset. The basic requirements that the um, that the uh, facilities connected to the grid take certain steps, all of them take certain steps as a basic protection against cybersecurity would not be subject to sunset. It would only be the emergency powers that are granted pursuant to special federal finding, presidential finding that there is a unique emergency that would be subject to some sunset. Yes, sir. And the, the permanent standards that we have established under Section 215 would not, sunset would not be affected. It would be the emergency actions, if you will. Thank you for that clarification. That is very helpful. Mr. Colliver, Mr. Kelleher, I know that both of you have urgent obligations elsewhere. We thank you for your attendance this morning and uh, you are excused. We now turn to our uh, remaining witnesses on the panel who have already been introduced. And we would ask uh, that your oral statements be kept to approximately five minutes, and that will leave us ample time for questions. Mr. Sergal, we'll be happy to begin with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is Rick Sergal. And I am the president of the North American Electrical Liability Corporation, but known here as NERC. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today on this, on this very special day and on this very important uh, topic. Um, let me be clear, the, the risk to the operation of the nation's electricity system from potential intrusion through the Internet into computerized system control capabilities, a.k.a. cybersecurity attacks, is real. It is not new. The Energy Policy Act of 2005, in which this committee played a major role and which for the first time authorized the promulgation and enforcement of mandatory reliability standards to protect the bulk power system, defined reliability standard as and specifically including cyber security protection. So you identified that early on. But at the same time, the nature of the threat is new every day because it changes all the time. And as the entity entrusted with protecting the reliability of the North American uh, bulk power system, subject to FERC oversight in the United States, NERC takes very seriously its responsibilities for protecting the cybersecurity of the North American bulk power system and meeting this ever-evolving threat. NERC now has the ability to enforce over 100 reliability standards, including nine dealing with cybersecurity. These standards have improved the reliability of the system, including its cybersecurity. However, cybersecurity threats are different from other reliability concerns. Potential threats can arise very quickly, requiring rapid, effective, and often confidential responses. Cybersecurity threats are more likely to be driven by intentional manipulation of devices as opposed to operational events in the bulk power system such as lightning or equipment uh, malfunctions. <coughs> when there is an imminent cybersecurity threat, the response must be immediate. It must provide for confidential treatment of critical information, rapid threat analysis, and directed actions necessary to address the threat. Now, NERC develops reliability standards using a transparent process that provides for full participation of interested parties and draws heavily on industry expertise. But this takes time and it takes transparent exchanges of data and views that are not well suited for a cybersecurity threat. For these reasons, it is NERC's position that in the event of an imminent cybersecurity threat, the U.S. government should be authorized to act immediately. With emergency responsibilities in the hand of government, NERC will be better able to do what it does best. That is develop and imp implement cybersecurity reliability standards that will harden the grid against intrusion and aid in response in responding effectively to cybersecurity uh, incidents. Now, NERC is committed to ensuring the reliability of, of, of the assets and assuring that NERC's efforts will be complementary to those of government and industry with regard to cybersecurity protection. And finally, assuring that there are no gaps and that that responsibility is clear for execution of cybersecurity protection uh, initiatives. 
With the helpful guidance from Chairman Langevin, NERC has elevated the importance and the urgency of understanding and, ad and addressing cybersecurity threats. Key elements of, of this strategy include consolidating responsibility for coordination of cyber and all cybersecurity matters across all NERC activities into a single responsibility area led by our new Chief uh, Security Officer, uh, Michael Asani, who is here with me today. Improving our standard setting process to enable us to, to set standards on a more expedited basis is also important, as well as raising the importance of the issue within the industry by engaging CEOs in and at a strategic and policy setting level, communicating more effectively with industry on critical infrastructure security matters, all right, and coordinating effectively with the multiple government stakeholders involved in protecting the grid from cybersecurity attacks. And you have talked about that several times this, this morning. But in summary, cybersecurity threats to the bulk power system are real. Working with the government and industry, NERC is committed to addressing these threats. However, in order to address an imminent cybersecurity threat, the federal government must have emergency authority to act. NERC commends the subcommittee's efforts to develop appropriate emergency legislation and pledges to assist in this, ever, in this effort in any way that we can. Uh, several times this morning you, you've discussed our actions with respect uh, to responding to, to Aurora. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's fair to say that when we acted uh, uh, with respect to Aurora by issuing our advisory, we did do some good, right? There has been progress as a result of sending that out. And we did the right thing to, to send it out. We also demonstrated, and for NERC painfully, right, the limitations of that process, the limitations with respect to every aspect of it, including who did it go to? You mentioned numbers here today, 1,200 and 1,500. I'm uncomfortable with all, with all of those because we know so much better who the individuals are that should get that today than we did at that time. But the most uh, uh, important thing that we demonstrated was the limitation of trying to use a voluntary standards process and thinking that it could deal with an emergency, uh, uh, emergency threat. We recognize that there's a better way to do that and would ask you to, to, to uh, uh, establish le legislation that can make that happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sergal. Ms. Kelly. Thank you. Um, I'm Susan Kelly. I'm the Vice President of Policy Analysis and the General Counsel of APPA. Um, and I have with me Alan Mosher, who's our Senior Director of Reliability. Um, we represent the interests of more than 2,000 publicly owned electric systems in 49 states, and we serve 45 million Americans. Those of you who know our industry know it's rare for our trade associations to speak with one voice on a federal energy policy issue. For legitimate reasons, we generally have very different views. But on the issue of protecting the bulk power system from cybersecurity emergencies, we have come together. APPA, the Canadian Electricity Association, the Edison Electric Institute, the Co Electric Consumers Resource Council, the Electric Power Supply Association, the Large Public Power Council, the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, and the Transmission Access Policy Study Group all support carefully crafted specific legislation as the basis to deal with the discrete issue of cyber system emergencies. We understand the seriousness of the issue and the need to deal with it, but at the same time we think that legislation needs to be carefully crafted and narrowly drawn. The subcommittee has asked me to address several issues regarding the House discussion draft. The full answers are in my written testimony and I will just hit the highlights here. The associations support the House discussion draft with the specific language options that the associations have proposed. As so modified, we think it provides the Commission with sufficient authority to deal with cyber system security emergencies. The draft would fill a narrow gap in the mandatory reliability standards regime that has been set up under Section 215. Under that section, FERC has certified NERC as the ERO. With the help of hundreds of industry volunteers, NERC develops and enforces mandatory reliability standards for the bulk power system to keep our lights on. FERC oversees NERC's activities in the United States, but NERC standards also apply to utilities in Canada and northern Mexico. This industry-based framework is working to assure the reliable planning and operation of the bulk power system. Cybersecurity emergencies present a special case for three different reasons. First, 
They require protection against deliberate malicious attacks intended to disrupt bulk power system operations. Second, new and unforeseen threats can arise very quickly, leaving little time to react. Third, there is a need for confidentiality, at least until the initial measures are in place. For these reasons, the Association supports specific legislation to deal with such emergencies. But it must not undermine the Section 215 framework. That framework needs to be able to continue to develop and mature. The House discussion draft dovetails with Section 215. It is limited to the users, owners and operators of the bulk power system. As NERC has applied that term in practice with FERC's approval, retail customers, local distribution facilities, small generators and small utilities are generally excluded from the scheme. Any new cybersecurity legislation should apply to the same universe of facilities and entities. To do otherwise would raise jurisdictional and implementation issues that could greatly complicate consideration of this legislation. State regulatory commissions regulate local distribution facilities. The State's authority to regulate the reliability of local distribution networks and service should be preserved. I was specifically asked to discuss the remaining differences between the associations and FERC on the House discussion draft. The associations negotiated at length with FERC staff regarding this draft. We reached closure on many issues. We thank the FERC staff for the constructive and positive attitude it displayed throughout the negotiations. We were unable to reach closure on three issues, but that should not undermine the very substantial progress that we did make. The three areas are. First, the definition of a cybersecurity threat, as you have already heard. The associations and FERC agreed on most elements of that definition, but we think our proposed language limits the legislation to true cybersecurity emergencies, meaning threats that have a substantial likelihood of happening and that could substantially disrupt operations if they do happen. FERC's proposed definition is broader. Uh, the second issue is the inclusion of national security threats. FERC wants to expand the legislation to include other national security threats as well as cybersecurity threats. Our associations believe that other government entities, both State and Federal, have more direct responsibility in the general area of national security. Moreover, this additional authority is quite vague in its wording and potentially all-encompassing in nature. We think including this language would spark an intense discussion that could slow the legislation down. Third, the sunset of interim measures that FERC enacts. We negotiated at length with FERC on the sunset provisions and we reached closure on all issues except one. And that has to do with whether the sunset after one year, unless there is an uh, indication from DOE or the President that it should continue, should apply to both the interim measures under subsection B and the emergency measures under subsection D. Subsection B deals with Aurora. Subsection C deals with what happens thereafter on a going forward basis. We think those measures and orders should be either time limited by, time limited by their natures or replaced by NERC reliability standards because in the long run we think the standards should deal with this. FERC doesn't agree with this position. We couldn't reach closure, but we do think that we made a lot of progress on legislation. As this process moves forward, we strongly urge Congress to retain the carefully crafted language that the associations support. We thank you very much and we stand ready to answer questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Kelly. Mr. Nauman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is Stephen Nauman. I am Vice President for Wholesale Marketing for Exelon Corporation. I serve as Vice Chairman of the Members Representative Committee of NERC. I am also accompanied by Mr. Dan Hill, Exelon's Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer. I appreciate the opportunity to testify about protecting the electric grid from cybersecurity threats. I am appearing today on behalf of the Edison Electric Institute and the Electric Power Supply Association, and Exelon is a member of both these groups. My testimony focuses primarily on the nature of the cybersecurity threats to the bulk power electric system and the efforts of electric utilities to respond to those threats, but it will also touch on the proposed legislation before the subcommittee. I want to start, however, by assuring the subcommittee that Exelon and other electric utilities take cybersecurity very seriously. Electric utilities routinely monitor for and detect electronic probing of their systems from a variety of sources, confirming the likelihood of real cybersecurity threats. However, utilities and other private sector entities are at a disadvantage in assessing the degree and the urgency 
of possible perceived cyber threats because of their limited access to intelligence possessed only by the government. Many cybersecurity issues are already being addressed under current law. Critical infrastructure protection standards have been implemented under Section 215 of the Federal Power Act, which provide for mandatory and forcible reliability rules. However, the current reliability regime has limitations in its ability to be responsive to emergencies require immediate, focused, and confidential actions. Therefore, it is appropriate for Congress to provide FERC with explicit authority to address cybersecurity in certain emergency situations. Any new FERC authority should be complementary to the existing authorities under Section 215 of the Federal Power Act which rely on the industry expertise as the foundation for developing reliability standards. Legislation should clarify the respective roles, responsibilities, and procedures of the federal government and of industry, be narrowly tailored to deal with real emergencies, and promote consultation with industry stakeholders and owner-operators of the bulk power system on remediation measures. The scope of damages that could result from a cybersecurity threat depend on the details of any particular incident. But a carefully planned cyber attack could have potentially serious consequences. In mitigating a particular cybersecurity vulnerability, electric utilities must also consider the potential consequences caused by any mitigation measure on safe and reliable utility operations. For these reasons, for ensuring the cybersecurity of the bulk power system, the best framework is one that utilizes the respective strengths of both the government and the electric companies. It is critically important that as much as possible, any cybersecurity framework provide for ongoing consultation and sharing of information between government agencies and utilities to the extent possible. In conclusion, I want to reassure the subcommittee that owners, operators, and users of the bulk power system take cybersecurity very seriously. We are actively engaged in addressing threats as they arise and in employing specific strategies that make every reasonable effort to protect our cyber infrastructures and mitigate the risks of cyber threats. As the industry relies increasingly on electronic and computerized devices and connections, and the nature of cyber threats continually evolves and becomes more complex, cybersecurity will remain a constant challenge. But we believe we are up to the task building on the industry's historic and deep-rooted commitment to maintaining system reliability. I appreciate the opportunity to appear today and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nauman. Mr. Lawson. Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on cybersecurity issues and their potential impacts on the bulk power system. My name is Barry Lawson, and I am the Manager of Power Delivery for the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. NRECA is a trade association consisting of nearly 1,000 cooperatives providing electricity to 41 million consumers in 47 states. One of my primary areas of responsibility at NRECA is reliability, including cybersecurity. NRECA and its members understand the importance of cybersecurity. To arrive at the draft bill before you today, NRECA has worked closely with its industry counterparts and with FERC and NERC. NRECA commends FERC under Chairman Kelleher's leadership for its proactive outreach on the topics we are discussing today. Provisions in this draft bill can provide swift, effective emergency protection to the bulk power system in those limited circumstances when NERC cannot. NRECA supports the House discussion draft with the specific language options proposed by the associations. NRECA has been actively engaged with NERC from its origin over 35 years ago to its transition into the industry ERO and as it issues reliability standards, including the cybersecurity standards FERC approved earlier this year. In January 2008, I began a two-year chairmanship of the NERC Critical Infrastructure Protection Committee. The CIPSI is a NERC standing committee that advises the NERC Board of Trustees on issues related to critical infrastructure protection, including cybersecurity. 
My position on the SIPSI requires me to interact with NERC, DOE, and DHS staff on an ongoing basis and contributes to the viewpoints I will share with you today. As both a participant in NERC and an interested observer of its role as the ERO, NRECA believes that the self-regulatory model is the best means of maintaining a strong, reliable bulk power system. This model recognizes that the industry, the electric industry, addresses events and threats every day, including those posed by natural disasters, vandalism, and equipment failures. Last fall, many members of Congress and the public were introduced to cybersecurity when news outlets ran a story and video showing a small electric generator that was damaged during a test. The news report said a government lab had demonstrated that computer hackers could cause physical damage to equipment through cyber means. The government labeled this vulnerability Aurora. Today, almost no one outside the intelligence community has been able to examine the technical and engineering details of the Aurora vulnerability. Key information about the vulnerability is still classified. Members of the NERC SIPSI first received limited, unclassified information about the Aurora vulnerability from DHS in March of 2007. We were strictly prohibited from sharing this information, meaning I could not inform member cooperatives. In June 2007, DHS placed, lim placed limited information and mitigation measures into a document that NERC utilized as an industry advisory. Although these measures did not reveal specifics about the vulnerability, cooperatives and other utilities that own or operate bulk power system facilities used their collective expertise to implement the measures on their individual systems. Aurora demonstrated the need for utilities to receive more timely and detailed information from intelligence sources about threats and vulnerabilities and their engineering, cyber, and mechanical implications. Under the existing rules and procedures created by NERC and approved by FERC, NERC can deal with a wide range of cyber threats. NERC standards development process can sometimes be lengthy to accommodate the highly technical nature of the subject matter, but it can also be shortened when expediency demands. NERC has two special procedures for developing standards more quickly. The urgent action process was developed to approve standards within a few months, and the emergency action process was developed to approve standards within a few weeks. Both processes should be used whenever, the, whenever needed for the expedient development of reliability standards, including those related to cybersecurity. As Mr. Sergal explained to you, NERC recently wrote its Board of Trustees and industry stakeholders to explain change, changes and improvements it plans regarding its focus on cybersecurity. This NERC initiative is critically important to the reliability of the bulk power system, and we support these efforts. NRECA is working closely with its counterparts across the industry and agrees there is potential for some cyber threats and vulnerabilities so imminent and substantial that even revised and strengthened NERC procedures cannot assure the timely distribution of information and direction to industry to effectuate an adequate industry response to protect the bulk power system. In those limited circumstances when the President of the United States has determined emergency action is warranted, FERC should be able, after consulting industry and government authorities in Canada and Mexico, to issue orders addressing the emergency. In conclusion, NRECA supports the House discussion draft with the specific language options proposed by the associations. Like our industry counterparts, NRECA is prepared to assist the subcommittee and full committee with advancing this legislation. NRECA also looks forward to continued cooperation with FERC. I am happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawson, and we thank each of the witnesses for their testimony here today. Uh, Mr. Nauman, maybe you can answer the question about cost of implementation. Uh, using the NERC advisory as the, the standard, uh, realizing that Mr. Kelleher uh, is suggesting that it probably didn't go far enough and that he thinks to completely address the Aurora vulnerability that steps beyond that should be taken. But, you know, leaving that aside, just use the NERC advisory as, as the foundation. What would it cost a typical investor-owned utility um, to comply with, uh, with that NERC advisory. Mr. Chairman, could I have uh, one second to consult with Mr. Hill, who probably can get me that answer? In the interest of getting the information, of course. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Mr. Chairman, to comply with the Aurora vulnerability, as we were told, and we believe we're fully compliant, was a relatively minor cost for across the entire Exelon company, and that included the nuclear stations, which technically were not not part of of, of the vulner the advisory. Having said that, we understand uh, from listening to Chairman Kelleher that they believe that there are additional vulnerabilities to Aurora that were not covered uh, by the advisory and that we don't really know about. It would be very hard to estimate the cost without knowing what the vulnerability is nor what the mitigation, recommended mitigation is. And Which is why I phrased the question only in terms of the, Turk, of the NERC advisory. Y yes, sir. Um, well, I'm, I'm pleased by your answer that it is a relatively minor cost. Is there a dollar figure attached to that relatively minor estimate? We don't have it now. If you want, we can try to obtain it, it that. It would be helpful if you could just send us a letter uh, addressed to the subcommittee following this hearing that states what you think the dollar cost to Exelon would have been across your company to meet uh, the uh, recommended uh, security measures contained in the NERC advisory. That would be very helpful to us. Let me extend that question to others on the panel who might want to respond on behalf of their associations. Ms. Kelly, Mr. Lawson, do you have any, um, any answer to what the, uh, the, the cost per covered entity would be? Um, I do not have any such answer for you at this time. Um, we could obviously provide that for the record. It would be helpful if you could, Mr. Lawson. And we will look to primarily the three utilities that came in and met from our membership with FERC to discuss um, the vulnerability and what they had done. But I would like to state, and I think Mr. Lawson may be able to elaborate, that there really is a question even as to the NERC advisory as to what constituted compliance. And, you know, it was not necessarily as clear as it might have been. And so, you know, there was certain, you know, it was a, how do I say, we weren't sure what the bar we were being asked to meet, and I think that was an Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to get as, as broad an estimate as possible. We're, we're in the posture now of statutory drafting, where we are going to be making some decisions in the very near term yeah. about how we empower FERC to move forward with its rulemaking on this subject. Now, a key part of those considerations will be time frames under which we expect that actions will be taken, actions uh, taken by uh, the FERC in advancing its rulemaking process to, to conclusion, uh, and then actions that would be taken by the covered entities to comply with the rules that FERC puts forward. We may or may not have specifications within the statute that address the latter part of that. But having some understanding of cost and to the extent that you would want to comment on it, other kinds of implementation challenges that you might foresee would assist us in that. Now, as Mr. Nauman pointed out, I fully realize that making definitive uh, decisions about this are, are difficult at this stage because we really don't know what FERC would choose to do beyond the NERC advisory in terms of steps that would be required for covered entities. Um, so probably our decision will be to simply empower FERC to set the time frames uh, for compliance by the covered entities. Uh, it would be um, difficult for us to establish that statutorily, but there may be those on our panel who want to do that. So having some information about what the cost to you would be, what other implementation issues you see, um, that, and just using the NERC advisory itself as a foundation would be helpful to us. Um, Mr. Lawson, would you have any comment about this? Similar to uh, <coughs> Susan Kelly's comments in that we don't have cost info from the individual cooperatives. I think the, uh, the best we could do would be to talk to the cooperatives that did meet with FERC on the Aurora Advisory and see if they have that kind of information that, that they can provide us. Um, it's important to understand that costs can vary depending on the scope of the assets at each utility. It's, it's going to be very difficult to have a typical cost. But, um, and also what I would be asking the cooperatives would be their costs associated with the language specifically in the NERC advisory. Okay, that, that would be fine. Let me move to one other question. And again, I'll, I'll ask you, as, as I've asked Mr. Kelleher to be somewhat brief in this answer, I would be interested in your views, um, succinctly spoken, on three questions. Uh, 
Number one, do you believe that the authority that we will be conferring on the FERC to guard against cybersecurity attacks should go beyond uh, the cybersecurity and actually cover physical attacks that might be made on the covered facilities? That's, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, address, if you will, the question of sunsets on uh, FERC actions, FER FERC orders. Uh, in the first category would be the basic steps that all covered entities would have to take in order to address the Aurora vulnerability specifically. I can tell you my own view is that ought to be permanent in nature, but if you disagree with that, I would like to hear a reason why. Uh, and the second category is uh, steps that would have to be taken by the covered entities under uh, FERC order pursuant to a presidentially declared unique emergency. Should there be a sunset on uh, those orders? And, uh, and if so, what should be the conditions that trigger the sunset? And then number three, what should be the basic scope of the authority that we extend to FERC with regard to the covered entities themselves? Should it just be the continental United States bulk power system, or should it extend uh, to Alaska and Hawaii and their separate electrical systems? Um, and should it extend to the distribution systems in our larger cities? And I know, Ms. Kelly, you addressed that at some length in, in, your, in your testimony, but I would like to hear what other witnesses have to say. So, um, in view of the fact that Mr. Shemkus is eagerly awaiting his question time, let me ask you to be as succinct as you can in providing that answer. Um, and who would like to begin? Mr. Circle? Yeah, address a couple of those uh, for you. Uh, our role here is to make sure that we can seamlessly and effectively implement whatever legislation you pass and do that uh, and further the good work that was established uh, when you modified Section uh, 215 and gave created an ERO. So that that's the the, the uh, w where I come from. I think with respect to how broad is the uh, is the authority, the highest priority is the bulk power system. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't important things on the distribution system. There are, and let me be clear, to the extent that the bill doesn't cover that, that will leave open something that w would, would not be there, and, uh, and that will make me uncomfortable that, that that's um, uh, uncovered. But the higher priority is the bulk, bulk power system. Uh, uh, I think uh, Hawaii and uh, Alaska are special considerations, and maybe that's independent of distribution, and potentially you could look at it that way, uh, because that's, uh, that's even a, a, a greater uh, a concern. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, with, with respect to the, the sort of the, the, the sunset provisions, we're going to be able to implement that successfully, regardless of what those provisions are. With respect to the authority, uh, and and how it's granted again, uh, it will it, it, we will be able to implement it effectively, uh, implement a bill however written. But the clearer that is, and the better that that's laid out, um, certainly we will we will be able to implement it. And finally, I would say with respect to and I think the the, the language in the uh, in the draft that I looked at was and other national uh, sec security threats. Again, with respect to that. Uh, Clearly, cybersecurity is, is, is the highest priority here. It's the single one that's most important. It's, it's what we have been focusing on. It's not to minimize other national security here in this context, but, but we be understand those better. We have other ways of, of doing those things. Uh, it's not the highest priority for, uh, for me. And okay. I, I will just answer. Th thank you, Mr. Circle. Ms. Kelly. Thank you. Um, your first question had to do with the physical attacks, and I'll start there. Uh, the association's position is no, that they should not be covered in this legislation, and in part for the reason that Mr. Sergal just stated is that there are other governmental authorities and entities. I would just note the FBI, the Department of Energy, state and local law enforcement that are all involved in that, those activities, and we already have to answer to a substantial number of masters um, in that regard. Um, second, the sunset question you asked. Uh, the association position is that that should apply to both the interim authorities that are exercised under B and the emergency authorities under C. Our reasoning for that was that, I'm sorry, 
Go ahead. Okay. Um, our reasoning behind that was that we regarded this as stopgap emergency authority for events that would either be time limited and thus would expire by their own um, terms or should be replaced by NERC set reliability standards. For that reason, we wanted the sunset to apply in both cases. We negotiated with the FERC over that. They did not like the so-called hard sunset. We reached, you know, okay, well, we, we understand that position, and for that reason, we agreed that it could continue past the year so long as there was a determination that the problem was still existing. Um, our thought was, in most cases, that NERC reliability standards should be in place by the end of that year, and therefore it would be a moot question. Um, but we understand that there is a difference of opinion, and, you know, that is legitimate. Well, with regard to these interim standards that are designed to address the aurora vulnerability, the aurora vulnerability is not going to go away as a security threat. Yes. Um, and uh, steps will need to be taken, therefore, on an ongoing basis to address that threat. Um, and I gather from your testimony that you are suggesting that the FERC um, should not be the perpetual agency to impose the requirements for what those steps ought to be. And, and I, I gather from what you are saying that you think that the NERC through its consensus-based rulemaking process um, should take a handoff of that authority after some period of time. Have I, correct, have I correctly interpreted your comments? I think that's, a, that's, yes, that is correct. Our view is, is that we understand the need for FERC to step in to act quickly, but we believe that that needs to then be run through the NERC standard setting process. In part, one of the reasons is, is you know, we in the industry you know, we think we actually have some expertise to offer on the best way to implement these standards. And we are also concerned about cost, let me just say that. Um, and we want to make sure that these standards, you know, especially if they are going to be in effect for a long time, are done in the most cost effective manner possible. And that is one of the things that the industry can bring to bear, its expertise can come to bear during the NERC standard setting process. So we are not kicking about FERC getting this authority under B to, you know, act to do this rulemaking on an expedited basis, but we are saying it should then be handed off to NERC. All right. Thank you. That is very clear. Uh, Mr. Nauman? Yes. yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on, on your first question, uh, the, the draft now has the words other national security threats, and we believe that is an extremely vague term and, and are uncomfortable with that. You, you also mentioned, rather than that, physical threats. And I agree with Mr. Sergal and Ms. Kelly. That is a lower priority. But if, in fact, there is going to be some additional authority beyond cyber, it should be very uh, much, much tighter language than, than overall other national security threats, which could be interpreted as having a uh, 90-day stockpile of coal or something like mm -hmm. that, which we think goes way beyond what All right, the that point is duly noted. immediate intent. As far as the sunset, I agree with Ms. Kelly. Uh, to the extent uh, there are interim measures for Aurora, to the extent they can be, can be and should be replaced by permanent uh, standards done uh, through industry expertise, that would be our preference. Uh, and with respect to the emergency action, again, I would prefer that if the requirements still remained, then the President should reissue the directive. Uh, uh, as far as the authority, it, it, on uh, Alaska and Hawaii, we understand that is a, a special situation of very important military installations there that somehow would need to be taken care of, but they are really not part of the scheme that we are dealing with. Major distribution systems in the cities? Th that is correct. Well, what, the major what, distribution what, yeah, system in the city gets, gets very complicated. We would hope that that could be done rather through consulta consultation with the state regulatory agencies who very well understand those systems, which New York is somewhat unique, D.C. is somewhat unique. Chicago is completely different from those systems and serve differently. And where do you, where do you get the cutoff on the what on the distributions don't go all the way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, thank you, Mr. Lawson. Uh, I agree with the comments you've heard from the other panelists. Uh, in addition, with regard to going beyond cybersecurity in the in the legislation, it's uh, to reiterate what Mr. Nauman stated about the vagueness and, and broadness of the definition that we were provided. That was problematic, and we we would very much want that tightened up uh, before we could agree to anything. 
Also, it is very important to recognize that the industry has been dealing with physical threats for decades and has done a, an excellent job dealing with physical threats. Cyber threats are the new issues here. That is where the new, the new focus should be and that is why this legislation should focus on the cyber threats. Uh, the industry is doing a very good job with dealing with the physical threats and has for a long, long time. With regard to the sunsets, we, um, if a, a, an, an order or directive needs to continue, we've, there are provisions in the legislation for that for, for a certain period of time. However, other than the order or directive, we want the, the industry through NERC standards development process to take care of those issues with standards. And as I mentioned in my, my oral statement about the, uh, the expedited standards development processes that NERC does have, we think that would be an excellent vehicle for addressing some of those issues. With regard to the scope uh, going to the distribution side of things or Alaska and Hawaii, with regard to distribution, of course, the, uh, the states and, and local authorities have, have many, uh, many uh, regulatory authorities in those areas. It is also important to realize that the bulk power system is where you can have the larger impacts. The distribution system is local and it is broken up into many small pieces and those impacts are often shorter in time frame and much more uh, limited in the numbers of meters that are not in service because of an incident. So we think those are reasons why this legislation should focus on the bulk power system. Mr. Lawson, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to at this time call on the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Nauman, um, please explain how your company has prepared itself for the tested and, I'm sorry, and tested its response to uh, cybersecurity threats. Well, uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, in, in my testimony, I, I referenced uh, defense in depth, and that, that includes, and I guess I'm going to use a number of technical words that, that we do. Uh, we segregate the networks that we have. Uh, we have a program of patch management, uh, much like uh, to, in a way to say you get updates on, on your micro, Microsoft software occasionally when there, when there is uh, uh, a vulnerability found. We do this on a very routine basis, sometimes on, a, on an emergency basis. We have intrusion detection sensors that we maintain on, on our network systems. We have security event monitoring. Uh, vulnerability testing. One of the things I mentioned in my, uh, my testimony is we hire outside firms to do penetration testing. In other words, they act as the red team to try to break into our system and we then learn from what, from what they tell us. Uh, we deal with all the time with security vendors, with the FBI, with local law enforcement. And lastly, we, we have in, uh, encrypted our data even to the point of, for example, the laptop that I carry with me, the data is encrypted so if it is stolen, uh, the, the data is, is worthless to somebody. Those are some of the measures that we take, Mr. Uh, 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 this is a, a, a real pressing issue and I know based upon um, the Aurora event um, and others, I follow um, the captive nations, the former captive nations of uh, the Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, Russia conducted a cyber attack against Estonia, um, I guess a year and a half ago, when the prelude into the intervention into Georgia was a cyber attack there. I mean, this, so this is real stuff. And that's why it's important. And I, and I appreciate uh, the chairman um, ident identifying it. So. Um, for you again, Mr. Nauman, uh, what resources and or information would make your efforts to defend against cybersecurity threats more effective? Congressman, probably the, the most important thing is access to information. As I said, we are, we are actively engaged in protecting our system against those threats that we know and those threats that, that we can try to figure out. We, we understand the, for good security purposes, there is information that we don't have access to. And there, there needs to be a way that the industry can work with the government and the government can work with the industry 
so that we can have access to that information, so that we understand what the vulnerabilities are, and so that we can agree on mitigation measures to do that. W without that, we, we feel like we're, we're fighting this battle with one, one hand tied behind our backs. Yeah, and let me ask about the emergency and interim authority issues and with our border friends, the Canadians and, and Mexico, and, and uh, uh, what do we think their response would be, and uh, is there some optimism? This is for our panel at, at, as a whole, so why don't we just start from left to right? Mm. I guess you're left. <laughs> My left. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Um, we work very effectively uh, with our partners in, uh, in, in Canada and to a, to a lesser extent but with Mexico uh, as well. NERC has a relationship with each of the eight uh, provinces as they have a decentralized responsibility for this in, in Canada uh, and those, those relationships are, are different. I think the single most important thing to, to keep that relationship um, uh, positive and as it is today is to separate the standard setting process which is what we do through section 215 as enabled by you and the United States to keep that separated from the emergency um, um, measures that one would would take because of an imminent threat as, as long as we as long as we keep those uh, separate as uh, then I think we'll be success, successful. So we su support um, the, the bill, support a bill here for, to, to take emergency actions, lots of discussion of that this, this morning. There needs to be a handoff of that to the standards process. If we do that, then we'll work very effectively with our neighbors. Um, I would just like to note that um, the Canadian Electricity Association submitted a statement for the record, which I would recommend for your review. Um, I would note also that I was somewhat disturbed by um, Mr. Colivar's discussion about giving FERC interim standards writing authority. That is the first that we have heard of that. Um, it goes exactly to the issue that um, Mr. Sergal just identified, which is you know, the way the 215 uh, scheme is set up is the industry with the, and NERC that together write the standards. That is not a government activity. Um, so that, I think, in particular would alarm the Canadians because they have to be you know, they, are, they have to abide by NERC standards. So in effect what is happening there is they are being asked to abide by standards written by a Federal Government U.S. agency. And that is a problem, I believe. I um, will let them speak for themselves. But just based upon what I know during our negotiations, I think that would be a concern. And you all can chime in if you want, but it is probably not a concern that you all would have. So. Uh, um, what are our vulnerabilities? Is our grid adequately protected by firewalls and passwords? Will a one-time cyber reliability rule solve the problem? Or will we have to constantly change and upgrade to keep up with the changing threats? Uh, and then, the, the, you know, this is a one over the world question. Won't government authority to constantly change uh, protections and systems risk express an unpredictable cost on system operators? Well, it's it's really for all because the question is, uh, we are as we firewall and protect bad guys evolve, uh, which is for you. But then the question is for industry or or for the, uh, the rules. Um, at what cost? How do how do we manage both? And uh, we try to get it as right as we can. So I, I, I think standards will, will, can take you just so far because there, there is an opportunity to harden the system, uh, to, to defend against those things which we understand, like, like passwords and, and firewalls, and, and have those be as effective as possible. We have done that with the standards that have been passed. They were developed cooperatively. Uh, with the with the in industry, and that process needs to con needs to evolve. But I think uh, it, it also suggests that a standard is out there to be seen. Everyone knows what we're what we're doing, how we're uh, how we're proposing to 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 implement it, and therefore it suggests that it that we have to be uh, constantly uh, vigilant and, and adapt as new problems arise. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Um, I would just add to that that. You know, we are concerned on an ongoing basis about the cost of compliance. There is no question about that. That was one of the reasons why 
our definition of cybersecurity threat is a little tighter than that that the Commission supports because, for example, we would not want to you know, be spending unknown amounts of time on new hardware, new software, new hardening, that kind of thing, for something which may not have a substantial possibility of disrupting the operation of the bulk power system. Um, and since theirs is phrased in the disjunctive, I believe that could possibly be the case. So I just note that for you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Nauman. Uh, Congressman, the only thing I, I would have to, I, two things to add. The first is we are always uh, on our own trying to protect against new threats and upgrading, upgrading our equipment. And as Mr. Sergal said, uh, a standard can only take you so far when something new is, is discovered. And, and plus, you have the risk of great loss. We we have our self-interest here, right? We're, but what I what I would say is that that's where the consultation between the government agencies and the users, owners, and operators is useful in both working out the mitigation and dealing with the co with with the cost effectiveness, as we do have experience in how to do this, and we we will do it. Obviously, we don't want an incident, but to work together to try to design the most, the best way to do this, uh, and and protect the the electric power system. And Mr. Lawson, just to add, I, I think it's important to understand that utilities deal with cyber issues every day because it's important to their business and it's important to the service that they're providing to their to their customers. It's, uh, it's not something that we, we deal with only because we have cybersecurity standards. It's because it's the right thing to do. It's the important thing to do. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shemkus. Uh, I'm going to ask unanimous consent, uh, Mr. Shemkus, Mr. Upton has already approved this, um, that we insert. So you don't want me messing with you, right? <laughs> well, uh, yes, that was the implication <laughs> of the question. <laughs> Uh, these are statements from the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, the Electricity Consumers uh, Resource Council, and the Canadian Electricity Association, all addressing the issue before the subcommittee today. Without objection, so ordered. That was perfect. Thank you so much. I want to thank our witnesses for their attendance today, for their very helpful testimony. We appreciate the time you have taken with us. We will look forward to your submission of the information that you have said you will supply to us. And as we take further steps in this process, we will be consulting with you. With that, uh, and thanks to the witnesses, this hearing is adjourned. Yeah. Still, I'm glad it was about that additional and other.